Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I used to think that meant that if I don't demonstrate peace and holiness, I can't see God. I can't have a relationship with Him. That may be true. But I really believe it's saying, if you don't show peace and holiness in your life, nobody will see the Lord in you. Unhappy, grumpy, worldly people never show Jesus to the world that needs to see it. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness bring you up trouble, you and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any prof- a fornicator, a profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Lord, I pray that you'd bless our time together in your word. I pray that you'd empower me and direct me by your spirit to say, just exactly what would please you, what would help your people that are here tonight. I do pray again you'd keep the devil and those fallen spirits that serve him from snatching away from our heart soil the seed of your perfect book. And I pray that you'd help us to receive gladly what you have this it is only even now that will be good ground. And I'll still be in these you speak. You bless the invitation as well as the preaching. We'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Two years ago, the theme for our church was looking into Jesus. That's the beginning of Hebrews 12. So I preached through the chapter. I got to this section and I thought this would be a good review. I preached about bitterness for a long time. First book the Lord ever let me have put in print. Uh, the one that's now called when you can't just get over it as a chapter on bitterness. I got studying this passage again and I saw something I had not seen before. Let me give you a little preview. You know, a preacher preached and he tells you the Bible means something, you go, huh, I'd have never known it meant that if he didn't tell me. It's probably not true. I know there's some things in the scripture hard to be understood, but essentially the things that were written for time were written for our learning. The Bible is not the Da Vinci Code. Every profession has a tendency to try to complicate things so that the ordinary people need them. To understand that the law does that. Preachers sometimes do that. But if you're a preacher preaching, you say, Wow, I never saw that before, but that's what it says. It's probably true. I'm going to make four statements, then I'm going to give you three points from our text. But when I get to point number three, don't put your shoes on. It's like 27 sub points, all right? Statement number one everybody has been hurt. It is impossible, but the offenses still come. Not in the same way, not to the same degree, but everybody's been hurt. Statement number two, these hurts can turn to bitterness. They don't have to, but they can. Bitterness is the hurt you hang on to. See, no dream. God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. Most intelligently, with an unfair of the grace of God, the root of it in the spring of trouble. Now, we say grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It's unmerited favor. That's fine. But really, grace is more than that. If I came by your house and I said, may I have a sandwich, and you gave me a sandwich, that would be unmerited favor. You do not owe me a sandwich. But I hardly go to the preacher and say, wow, but the Lord, you will have to leave the grace when your members told me they gave me a sandwich. Had peanut butter and jelly on it. When I came by your house, I took a nice pick and punctured all the tires and all your vehicles. I poured sugar down the gas tanks. I let your dog run away. And I soaked all your windows and tore the laundry down and kicked it in the dirt and, and dug up your scrubs. And then I knocked on the door and said, Hey, I'm hungry. Could I please have a sandwich? If you gave me a sandwich then, that would be grace. Grace is more than unmerited favor. Grace is favor shown to people who have demerit. They sang it well when the Lord Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. We were His enemies. So for the purpose of our discussion tonight, grace 
It's essentially giving good to people who deserve bad. Now, that must have pretty strong. For the same guys say you got a root of bitterness, it's a poison you feed yourself, it's a chance to reach up the inside out. Get it out! Get rid of the root of bitterness! People come to an altar, they pray, and it would work for a while. Then something would happen. A little girl during the same age of mother had been when an awful event occurred in the mother's life. Anniversary of a terrible event. Somebody been out of your life would come back in. And all those feelings would come roiling back up to the surface and they'd say, Oh, it didn't work. I thought I was over it. But I guess I didn't do it right. Or, I guess, the Bible didn't work. Here's statement number four. I run into the church tangent of the bitterness. God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. Number four, dealing with these hurts is not a one time experience, but an exercise that must be repeated every time the hurts come up. If you read this text, just read it plainly, there is nothing in there about removing the roots of bitterness. The inference of the scripture is that the roots are always there. Every once in a while they spring up, and every time they spring up, we've got to respond with grace again. Now, in our 21st century culture, we like immediate fixes. We don't want to bake it, we want to microwave it. We want to get a fix. Just, you know, cut something out, give me a pill, fix it. A lot of the Christian lives are not like that. It's an exercise. We're told to exercise ourselves into godliness. I exercise. I always tell people that because they would never suspect so otherwise. I'll do three to six hours a week on the elliptical for the preacher at lunch. I'm getting so good at it. Pretty soon I'm going to start moving the pedals. Now here's the deal. If I exercise really hard, if I gave it everything I had, I put my best into it, and you can measure everything about my health before and after, you can measure my aerobic capacity, you can measure my heartbeat, you can measure my blood pressure, you can measure my cholesterol, everything about me, you find out there was so little difference from one time exercising that it's not worth it. You have to choose between exercising once or never choose never. Looks like some of you have. But, if you exercise over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, it has a really positive effect. I'll show you a Fitbit after you help me. My resting heart rate is in the mid 50s. I have low heart rate, I have low cholesterol, I have low IQ. <laughs> Dealing with these births is not a one time experience, but an exercise. It must be repeated every time the hurt springs up. So let's look at our text. Number one, the Bible talks about roots. It calls it a root of bitterness. Now, a few things about roots. Number one, roots are covered. I've heard people compliment the flowers, blossoms, food on a tree, the leaves on a tree, the branches on a tree, and the bark on a tree. I've never heard say, wow, look at the roots on that tree. Covered. I don't you tonight. I think the expression you choose to place on your face. Pretended attention. Bored indifference. It's common. But these roots are caustic. They're roots of bitterness. There's some experiences you've had. There's some people that the very memory of that event or that individual can make your mouth pucker up like you've been sucking on a lemon. It's bitter. The Bible says these roots come up. The thing we're going to do is bring you up. Now, here's what we like to say. We behave bad to each other. I'm not really like that. I was just having a bad day. That's not really me. I was just in a bad place. So I'm going to a little quiz. I gave you one last time. I said you did very well at it. So two questions for the quiz today. Number one, if I squeeze an orange really hard, what will come out? What kind of juice? Oh, 
good. Smart bunch. Question number two, why will orange juice come out of the orange if I squeeze it really hard? Huh? Because there's juice in it. That's what's in there. Now, if I squeeze it just right, can I get grapefruit juice out of it? If I squeeze it really hard, can I get tomato juice? So I can't get anything out of it that's not already in it. Nobody ever hit their thumb with a hammer and then said a bad word they've never heard. <laughs> it's not in there, it can't come out. I heard about a young man preaching a sermon early in his, his uh, experience. He'd been called and hadn't even been to school yet. And he worked really hard and read after a lot of other preachers. As he's preaching along, old lady about three rows back in the aisle, but she recognized the source of some of it, and she said out loud, that's Charles Spurgeon. Well, it was, because I was a little rude of her. He ignored it, went on. A little bit later, she said, that's D.L. Moody. So he stared at her. Through that nature of behavior. It didn't affect her a bit. A little later, she said, that's Billy Sunday. He had all you can He said, lady, would you shut up and let me finish my sermon? And she said, that's you. <laughs> Yeah, those unkind words in the car on the way here, that's you. Yep. Our conversation to the children, that's you. I think children should not be coddled, but I do think they should be loved. Uh, my mother, she'd always say to me when I did something wrong, she'd say, I'm going to jump down your throat and dance on your liver. <laughs> I do not know what that meant, but I'm pretty sure it didn't want it to happen. The Bible does say the sweetness of the lips increase the learning. These words come up. But then the Bible talks about the results of it. And this is really intriguing to me. Looking diligently, the same man filled with the grace of God, lest any root of it is bringing up trouble you. The first result of it is difficulty for you. Well, that's interesting. Why is it we hang on to those words? Why is it we tell people over and over again the terrible things that were done to us, the awful behavior of somebody else toward us? I don't tell you why, because some things are so bad, they don't deserve to be forgiven. That person shouldn't be let off the hook. But the Bible says, when you hang on to bitterness, it doesn't hurt the person who hurts you, it hurts you. Does that make sense? I try that again. When you hang on to bitterness, it doesn't hurt the person. It hurts hurt you. It hurts you. Difficulty for you. I was in college. So young man in college, he school about 5,000 people. And the uh, young man, his dad was a preacher. My dad was a preacher. And he was not in my life. He was not a friend. He was not an enemy. He was just there. One day my dad said, hey, this young man's dad told me that his son told him that, that you said you hated his guts and wanted to punch his face in. I said, Dad, I never said that. My dad said, well, son, you need to make it right. I said, Dad, why should I make it right? I didn't do anything wrong. Hoping for a little support. Hey, who is responsible to take the initiative to make things right when there's a problem between brothers. This is the person who has taken offense or the person who has caused the offense. Who is it? I think we have a divided church. There's some taking, some cause, and some, uh huh. Matthew chapter 5. The Lord Jesus, through the mount, said, Therefore, if thou bringest thy gift to the altar, and there remembers for thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. First, go be reconciled to thy brother. I like that, leave thy gift before the altar. It doesn't say stop tithing. So, you have caused the offense. The brother has something against you. It may be reasonable or unreasonable, right or wrong, but you're the cause. And the Lord Jesus said, you know he's upset with you. You caused the problem. You go to him and make it right. But 
In Matthew 18, the Lord Jesus said, If you have ought against your brother, you go to him and tell him his fault between he and me alone. If he hears me, you gain your brother. So in Matthew 18, he said, If you take an offense, you go see him. Matthew 5, he said, If you cause offense, you go see him. In other words, the Lord Jesus said, Don't sit around trying to find out whose fault it is. Just go and make it right. So what's this young man? I said, my dad said, and your dad said, that you said, that I said, that I hated your guts and I wanted to punch your face in it, and I never said that. And you know what happened. The Spirit of God convicted him about his blinder towards me. He was deeply moved. He broke first into tears. Put on my arms, apologized. We became the best of friends. He went into business. He became very successful. And just last month, he wrote me a check for $500,000. Boy, this is a tough crowd. No, you know what happened. He said, uh, it's okay. Really? It's okay. You lied about me. I'm in trouble with my dad. And it's okay. I guess it didn't work, did it? Well, I don't know. I honored my father. I obeyed the Bible. I had a clear conscience. Here's what I Graduate in college, you mm-hmm. pastor two years into the church where I was pastor for 44 years in 1975, was there two, two and a half years ago. In the early ministry, maybe we've been there three years or so, we were having a big day, trying to have 500 in attendance, first time in the history of the church. And this young man's dad had a ministry an hour and a half or so for us, had a singing group. About 14 people in the singing group, so I invited the group to come. There were 14 people in the group, we have 500 three in attendance. So, preacher boys, here's a little tip. One way to have big days is to invite large groups. And this young man and I had talked about our friends, we're just doing God, what's going on? A couple weeks later, I got a letter from him. Dear Brother Lett, I need to write and confess to you that all these years I have harbored against you, not bitterness. Here's another freebie. I have limited success helping bitter people see that they are bitter. I'll show them the Bible. I'll repeat what they just said. I'll say, it looks to me like you have a little bit of me. And the normal response is, I'm not there. <laughs> Got it. Don't know how I made that mistake. <laughs> then he said, not bitterness, but a trace of resentment. I think that's Greek for bitterness. I'm not sure. Now, here's the deal. All those years that young man harbored against the trace of resentment, it never bothered me one time. Didn't keep me from enjoying dinner with my wife, telling people our church family, going out soul winning, preaching the sermon, serving God. No, no, no. It never bothered me. It always bothered him. Bitterness brings difficulty for you. It is the poison you feed yourself. It is a cancer that eats up from the inside out. But then the Bible was on to say, and thereby many be defiled. Result number two is defilement for others. I would suggest you that in our text, Esau is not really the example of a bitter person, but an example of the person who has been defiled by the bitterness of another, his mother. She saw God wasn't keeping his promise and letting Jacob get the blessing, and Isaac was about to give it to Esau. She took matters in her own hands. She had Jacob lie to his father. She helped this her husband. When you read the Bible, you find out that Esau married the people that he married because he saw that it displeased his parents. He was defiled by the bitterness of his mother. He became a profane person. No place in his life for God. He became a fornicator. I've been in church with preacher. Tell your best illustration, your funniest joke, your most helpful sermon. There's a cloud over the congregation that nothing could hear. And I stayed around long enough to find out the preacher was bitter. He had reason, he'd been hurt. But his bitterness didn't stop with him and affected the entire congregation. You can't be bitter. It won't stop with you. It'll affect your spouse. It'll affect your children. It'll affect people. It's a try to be helpful to and try to minister to you. It never stops with you. It always defiles somebody else. So what do you do about it? Is it the root? The result? What's the remedy? Well, great. Do good to be the of bad. That's all through the Bible. Don't render evil. Never have your blessing. Bless them that curse you. Let me 
break it down with three parts. Number one, if you're going to do good to people who deserve bad, you'll have to have faith. That means you'll have to believe that God knows what He's doing and He does what He says. Listen, give you a little, little uh, question and answer. You'll use found if you, if you think you know the answer. Is there a God? Well, you did 5% better than the Democrats did at their convention eight or 10 years ago. Does He love you? Did He promise to work together everything for good if you love Him and are called according to His purpose? Do you believe that? Well, then, nothing bad anybody does to you can ultimately hurt you. Joseph said to his brother, you men of evil, God meant it for good. I like that. My favorite statement he made is this. So then it was not you that sent me hither, but God, God put me at Potiphar's. God put me in the prison. And then God put me in the palace. Did you know the worst your adversary can ever do to you is be the unwitting instrument of God to accomplish God's purpose in your life? Hey! God's at work. He told me to be good for the people who are bad. I'll do it because he said so. I'll do it because I trust him. I'll do it because I know he will work all things together for good. I should follow some music director for 12 years. Little Ronnie Jessica, from the time she was really young, always wanted to be a missionary. My grandson Ethan just turned 10. He wants to be a missionary to Afghanistan. Seen enough on the news, he said, if they persecute me there, he said, I'll just run to Israel. Or he said, maybe I'll drive. Sweet little girl, beautiful little girl. One Wednesday night, I walked into church, and she saw me, ran out, gave me a big hug, and she said, Uncle Preacher, I'm going to God's country tonight. They were going to Georgia to be in a wedding right after the service. They ran to the van. The roads were clear, but the overpass of her I see, and as they went across an overpass down by an the cars slid and smacked into the guardrail. It wasn't a big deal, really. They were found, bumps, bruises, didn't really get any attention. Except that Jessica's window by her seat popped out on impact. She wasn't in the seat belt, she was lying on the floor trying to get some rest and rest. Impact threw her out that now open window and she smashed to the pavement and died. They went to St. Joseph's Hospital in Ann Arbor. A chaplain came by. He'd been to chaplain school. And he said, Well, there are some things God can't help. Not my God. Our God sitting in the heavens. He has done whatsoever He pleased. But he said, God wants to be there to help you through the things He can't help. In spite of the shock of that awful experience and the grief of that wreck, Roger Powell looked into the eyes of that unsaved man and he said, Mister, this was not an accident. This was an appointment. Hey, let's say a little seven year old girl, I was going to be a missionary, dies in a car wreck. What's good about that? I didn't say it for you. God didn't say it for He said he worked it together for good. Well, I wrote a track for just a picture on the front. We printed it at our church. And thousands and thousands of copies of that track have been distributed. I believe hundreds of people have been saved. People come to other churches and they say, hey, can I get some of those Jessica tracks? Every other year, our church for our Christians, we do a big pass the pile of lighting. It's a production of all kind of lighting, costumes, scenery, up two, three times as many songs as during the, the CD we take it from. And, after Jessica died, she died in December that April. We're doing past the pirate goes to the jungle about missionary work. And since Jessica always wanted to be a missionary, we dedicated the play to her, put her picture on the back of the program, told her story, 
and the play was done, and I gave the invitation. The young man came over here and said, Preacher, I think God wants me to be a missionary. The young lady came behind him and said, I think God wants me to be a missionary. Rodney Rupel and Becky Swain went off to Bible college. They graduated. They got married. They've been missionaries in Cambodia for over 25 years. And September, I had the privilege of preaching this pending service for a young couple, both out of our church, going to go and help them in the land of Cambodia. I don't know everything God was doing, but I know something. And I know she said, Uncle Preacher, I'm going to God's country tonight. He said, Yeah. Hey, number two, forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, I know you've got to forgive and forget. No, not really. What's your name? Yeah, yeah, I want you to forget your name. What's your name? <laughs> She always just rebellious. <laughs> what mechanism could he employ to forget his name? Your mind is made so that you never really forget anything. Now, you can't always remember it when you want to. Now, at the moment, I told about the old guy talking to friend. How you doing? He said, I'm doing better since I got that new medicine. Really? So what are you taking? He said, oh, oh. He said, what's, what's the name of flowers? You see red. It smells pretty. It's got thorns on it. He said, Rose? Yeah. Yeah. He said, hey, Rose. What's the name of that medicine I've been taking? Not as bad as the two old guys heard about sitting on their rockers on the front porch and the one turned to the other. And he said, I always forget, was it you or your brother that was killed in the war? Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. The literal meaning of the word forgiveness is to cancel a debt. So I borrow 10 bucks from Brother Kendrick. So you pay it back tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. So man, I forgot. I'll pay it back on Friday. See him Friday. I'm sorry. I forgot. I'll pay it back on Sunday. See him Sunday. I'm sorry. I forgot. I'll pay it back next Wednesday. See him Wednesday. See him. I'm sorry. I forgot. He says, struggle with that. Please don't worry about it. I've got lots of money. One of the hardest things in my ministry is deciding where to allocate all the funds that God sends through my hands. I'll just forgive the debt. How do you do that? Or you could say, well, that the ten bucks didn't be you, but I wish you'd pay it back because I'd like to think of you as the man of integrity. You can do that. What he cannot do is tell me I don't own the money and tell you I do. Because once he cancels the debt, I don't owe him anything anymore. Once you forgive somebody, they don't owe you anything anymore. Now, they may spring up. He has to remind yourself, oh, I forgave that person. The debt is canceled. They don't owe me anything. What about a man who went to a marriage counselor? It's just a story because men never go to marriage counselors. Just to drag them by their wife. That's because men never have any problems. That they admit to it. Give you another freebie, ladies. Don't ever ask a man, are you sure? We are always sure. We are not always right, but we are always sure. They went to the marriage house and the house says, what's the issue? He said, what problems my wife? He said, what about her? He said, man, every time we get in a disagreement, she gets historical. He said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, no, I mean historical. She brings up everything I ever did. You know how short the argument would be if all you could talk about was those three muddy footprints? And not 47 other times you did the same thing? He said, men and women are both crazy. Men mess up your house, they leave a trail of stuff so you can find them. And women, there's something inbred in the women. Don't tell me there's no difference between the genders. Women want to put a piece of paper in every nook and cranny in the entire car. Straw wrappers and tissue papers and candy wrappers tucked into the window, tucked into the door handle, tucked. Women are crazy. They treat the car in the garage just, just like you treat the rest of the house. Historical. Yeah. Once you forgive them, you don't bring it up again. The best human definition of forgiveness I read was in a book. A guy, I just met him one time. I preached at a meeting with him. He wrote a book called The Whole of No Hope. 
And he said in that little booklet, forgiveness is agreeing to live with the unchangeable consequences of another's sin against me. Pretty good. Remedy, faith, forgiveness. Number two, and number three, excuse me. I did go to public school, so I'm having a little trouble with that. Yeah, so fight. All right, who do I get to hit? The weapons of our warfare. And our kind of the mighty and the gods of the pulling down a stronghold. And then it says, casting down imaginations, bringing every thought and captivity to the obedience of Christ. Did you know the battle for success and failure is fought and waged and won or lost in your mind? Whoever controls your mind controls you. Now realize we're going to fight in the devil. My dear friend Dr. Malone told the story of time he was driving in a vehicle, the devil was bothering me. He stopped the car and opened the door and he said, this is my car. My name's on the title. I paid the payment on the note. You get out! Great story. Now how you fight the devil. When the Lord Jesus was tempted, the devil responded every time with Scripture. So here's what you do. You get a verse or two that deals with the issue the devil always brings up in your mind. And every time it comes up, you quote it. Put it out loud if you can. Put it on the mirror of the, of the bathroom when you get ready. Put it on the vines of the car. Put it on your phone. Every pop of every 30 minutes or so. And you may have to repeat that verse a thousand times a day. I can't prove what I'm about to suggest, but I think you'll find it's accurate. That's why I only go it 500 times. 200 times, 100 times, 50 times, 10 times. Because I think the devil will get tired of every time he tries to separate you from God, drive you back to God, and he'll leave you alone. Young lady had been attacked and abused in the most awful way imaginable by a man. Strange. She went to a pastor and he gave her biblical but really strange advice. He said, Well, the Bible says you should love your enemy. Done. Not sure that's what I want to hear in that circumstance. By the way, what we want to hear, we need to hear very seldom the same thing. You can go to a want to hear church if you want to. You go to a need to hear church if you come here. And then he said, the Bible tells us how to love our enemies. It says, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So just say good things about them, do good things to them, and pray for them. She covenanted to do that with his men. She would only say good about them. She maybe sent him some money anonymously while he was in jail awaiting trial to meet his personal needs. And she prayed, not for God to judge him, but for God to save him, to help him, to change him. And he didn't have it all at once. It was an expert time. I'm glad you go through the time cloud lifted and the sky is clear and joy came back into her life and she got married, had a family, did fine. And one day, she was in the grocery store, walked around the end of the aisle and came face to face with that man. He had served his sentence, been released from jail, and she looked into the eyes of that friend who had so horribly abused her and she felt nothing. The Word of God, faithfully applied over a long period of time, had given her victory. Everybody's been hurt. These hurts can turn to bitterness. God tells us to respond to these hurts with grace. Dealing with these hurts is not a one time experience, but an exercise that must be repeated every time the hurts come back. 